talking with a friend um, this last week, a colleague, and sort of explaining the context of uh, this webinar. And as we talked, um, we were talking about what it is that teachers misunderstand about content-based instruction and project-based language learning. And she used a metaphor that I thought was incredibly appropriate, which was the idea of linguistic Legos. So I want to use that metaphor to help us think a little bit about scaffolding. Um, and I guess I should give her credit first. Um, her name is Ani Fritzen Case, and she is a professor at Gonzaga University, uh, working also in languages. So when we think about Legos, um, the idea for most kids is that they want to be able to create with the language, right? If, if we think of the Legos as the individual bits of grammar and vocabulary, a lot of times teachers want to give those Legos to students in very structured ways. But if you look at how students or children play with Legos, they just want to build stuff. Um, they don't want to know all of the names of the pieces, et cetera. And a lot of language teachers say, well, that's great, and yeah, you can let students experiment with the language, but the bottom line is my beginning language learners, they need more pieces before I can let them do anything with the language. They can't create with language till they have more language. Um, my thinking about this is what if learners just need different pieces? If we're giving them the same thing every single day, um, it doesn't motivate or inspire much of a desire to create. And what if they need a place to explore? What if they need the tools to get there? What if they need a plan? What if they need the skills that they need in order to accomplish that? And so I think for a lot of language teachers, when we think about project-based language learning, the language piece is very scary to us because our thinking is students don't have the skills to make stuff with their language. And I guess the metaphor that I would like to suggest that we play around with and experiment with together is what would happen if, rather than being so certain that we understand how language learning works, and all of the things that are necessary for it to work, what if we were willing to set those preconceptions aside and ask ourselves, what would happen if we gave students meaningful opportunities to play with language, to experiment with language? What if we gave students more context for the language we're asking them to engage with? What if we gave students more opportunities to engage with culture? And instead of thinking of that as teaching culture, what if we thought of it as helping students to become better learners of culture? Meaning that students are going to have to learn how to observe. Uh, they are going to have to learn how to compare and contrast and identify what things are unique to a culture and what things are just part of life in general across cultures. What if we gave students more exposure to content knowledge? and more opportunities to take their linguistic Legos and just play, just experiment. And I think that one of the things that we forget as teachers, because we've spent so much of our lives trying to learn how to present content, is that a lot of the joy of learning comes from playing, playing with new ideas, thinking about things we've never thought about, being exposed to stuff that is novel and interesting. And I think that is what project-based language learning does. When students have interesting ideas to think about or interesting issues that we raise, they can't help themselves. They want to communicate about them. And if we are careful about how we structure their language learning environments and experiences, we can put the supports in place so that they can actually be successful. Now, are they going to be speaking at the paragraph level in a level one class? when we ask them to debate something? No. And I think that's part of what we have to accept as well, that they're going to be engaging with the content in linguistically simplistic ways that are conceptually complex. As students play with language, they see different possibilities, and that shifts their perspective and their reasons for learning language. 
I really like this example of the metaphor. Um, this is a 12-year-old kid, you may have seen him in the news recently, who basically figured out how to take a Braille printer or how to build a Braille printer with Legos. And in doing so, he was able to drop the cost of the printer's creation from something, and I don't remember what the original figure was, to about, I think it's, I don't know, it, but more than, by more than half. So essentially what he did is he made the Braille printer affordable for people who could not afford to buy the commercially produced ones by choosing to make it out of Legos. Now if we think about that in terms of a project, what are some of the things he would have needed to see or hear or understand in order to do that? Well, first of all, he needed to have some measure of understanding, you know, conceptually, about what some of the problems and issues of being blind are. Secondly, he had to have some sort of interest or concern about the fact that there is a problem for, you know, of access in, that is based on socioeconomics. The third piece is that he needed opportunities to play around to put pieces together, to think about, oh, what could I do about this problem? Um, and you can read the story yourself um, after the, the webinar, but I think that this is ultimately sort of the direction we want to go with language learning, is to, when, when students have meaningful reasons to think about um, their language and to use it for a real purpose, it completely changes not only their engagement, but what they're willing to go find out and persevere in order to accomplish. Okay, so what does that do for us in terms of scaffolding? Well, there are lots of places where project-based language learning or language learning of any kind in any context can break down. Um, this is sort of a very simplistic model but I think it's useful in helping us to think about, okay, so if I want students to do something that complex, especially with content that they don't already know, and especially with language that they don't already know, where do I have to put in the support? And I think most of us think, oh, it's just the language. I have to support their language. My suggestion to you is that it's not the language per se, although that can be a, a useful and an important piece. That's the piece we're all the most worried about. But I propose that if you are providing adequate support in all of these other areas, a lot of the things that you're worried about with regard to the language take care of themselves. So creating a classroom environment where learners feel supported where learners feel like they can take risks, where you have very clear routines and procedures for uh, routine tasks that learners are going to complete can be a powerful piece. And, and in fact, I would say it's an essential piece of successful project-based language learning. Um, if everybody's always confused about what they're supposed to do and when they're supposed to do it and how and why, then you as the teacher become the sole purveyor of all of the answers, which means you as the teacher have to make all the decisions, answer all of the questions, et cetera. But in a project-based language learning classroom where the teacher has really cultivated an environment of risk-taking and interdependence and taking initiative and self-responsibility and self-assessment, students start to take on a lot of those tasks students start to support and help one another. And students are willing to play and experiment with language because you have removed a lot of the social anxieties that they feel about doing that. Mistakes are okay. Asking questions are okay, is okay. The second place is purpose and context. So a lot of times we don't ask students to do things for meaningful purposes. We've already kind of spent a lot of time on that, so I'm not going to do a lot here with that. Uh, the third piece is process. And particularly with project-based language learning, I think teachers make the assumption that because they are working with adults in particular, if you're in a university context, I have been guilty of this, um, that because they're working with adults, that means you can just say, I want you to go make a board game, for example. Um, to review X, Y, or Z thing, or I want you to go do this project. And to you, because you know what you want the final result to look like, that is perfectly clear. 
but for learners who don't have the content background or the language background and who may not necessarily even have the, the process-based skills, the, the critical thinking skills, the technology skills, et cetera, that is an overwhelming proposition. So when I'm thinking about scaffolding, say we'll use the board game example, I want to create supports that are actually going to use the language to lead students through every decision they have to make during that process. So the first decision is who's going to be in your group. And I'm going to put on my worksheet in very simple language, you know, write down your group members' names or whatever, you know, in my target language. The second piece is that I'm going to ask students to think about games that they already know. So I'm going to activate their prior knowledge and say, what are some of the games that you have played before? Make a list. Then the third step is I'm going to ask them to analyze their own personal experience. Now that they've made a list of the games they've played, what about those games makes them fun to play? And so maybe they're going to list a few characteristics. And if I don't feel they're going to have the language to do it, I might give them a word bank. And I might use visuals to help them understand what those words mean. Then my next step is going to be, well, what pieces, you know, which of those things that make games fun to play are you going to use in your game? Cir circle them. So notice I'm step by step leading them through the decisions that they need to make. Then maybe my next piece is that I'm going to ask them, you know, what are some of the objects or tools or pieces in a game? You know, do you have a timer? Do you have um, game pieces? Are you going to have a game board? So I might list those vocabulary items and once again show them with pictures what it is that I'm talking about. So by the time we get to the point where they're actually ready to think about their game, and maybe I've said, you know, a lot of games are created based on different um, real life ideas. So they're based on the idea of a hospital and operation, you know, having an operation. Or they're based on the idea of decisions that you have to make in life or whatever the case might be. So I'm going to refer to games I think they know about in order to have them pick the context for their game. So by the time they've made it through the end of that worksheet, they've acquired a lot of vocabulary. They've connected the purpose of whatever it is I've asked them to do with their own personal background knowledge. They have had to critically analyze the task and figure out or make decisions about all of the pieces of the task so that now when they sit down to actually create the game, they've already made the decisions. And when they're working in their groups, now it's an easy thing to sort of move things forward. Content is the third piece, and then the last piece is the metacognition of the learner. This is how we typically think about scaffolding content um, as teachers. We think, okay, they're going to play with the Lego bricks, and so I'm going to give them all of the technical detailed information they need or, you know, technical detailed information about that content uh, and that would be my scaffolding. And yet if I were to hand this to a five-year-old who wants to play with Legos, this is not helpful in any way, shape, or form. They don't care. They just want to build stuff. When I look at how Lego approaches scaffolding, I learned some really important lessons about scaffolding language learning. The first thing I learn is that they detail all the parts. The second thing that I learn is that students are given very visual instructions. Most of what they have to do is visual. Now, while we as language teachers aren't just going to give the students pictures, um, what that does suggest to me is that organizing things visually, like worksheets, uh, how we set up the templates and materials really does guide students' thinking. The third thing you'll notice is that each instruction, each step of the instruction, happens one piece at a time. So I can visually see what changes from step one to step two, from step two to step three. And when I come down here to these little steps where I have to build the house before I can put the house on, they have given me separate instructions for that. This is something that I see language teachers um, have problems with a lot is that we assume a lot of prior knowledge on the part of students and so we skip steps. This is especially true when we scaffold technology. We assume students are going to be able to make the connections or see the connections or know that they need to click save and we don't give them all of the steps. 
So when we look at how Lego scaffolds, we can see that when we do things visually, it increases access. If we do our scaffolding well, it will increase students' access to content. We can use color and shape to guide students' attention to important pieces of language. We, by keeping things simple and sequential, we develop students' ability to do these things autonomously. I've seen lots of little kids, even younger than five, take these picture-based instructions and be able to create the products without any sort of adult intervention. And last of all, by providing step-by-step -step instructions, we help them to perform complex tasks. And I think that's the big piece of language scaffolding. There's a lot of uh, information and resources that I have put on the website for you to help you think about scaffolding content. Um, as we think about activating prior knowledge and experiences, um, helping students to recall the experience, to evaluate or, or analyze or reflect on the experience, and then to apply that learning, the board game being an example of that. Providing models. A lot of times students can figure it out just from seeing a model. Um, and then the language pieces we can put in place for them. Um, the bottom line is that scaffolding language and content and technology are each topics that uh, an entire three-hour workshop could be devoted to. And so I know that some of you probably would have liked more concrete examples, and as I said, I've tried to link those up so that you can explore them individually. Um, the main thing that I'm hoping that you will walk away with today as we conclude are, is the idea that um, there are some key principles that you can use as you're planning your projects and as you're scaffolding your projects that will help your students to have more success. And instead of expecting somebody to sort of hand you everything ready-made, you will actually become a more powerful teacher if you will allow yourself to experiment with those principles, just like with the Legos. Um, go play with them. So I think I'll um, stop there, actually, although I do really love this slide, uh, in terms of when we're thinking about selecting text. Think about it in terms of um, inter interacting with Facebook. Are the texts that you're selecting for your learners things that would make you click if you saw them on Facebook? Will they challenge you to think new thoughts or elicit emotional responses? Will it help you solve problems? Would you want to make it a part of your world or of your life? Uh, and with that, I think we will, we've got about a minute for questions. Um, I'm happy to answer questions off uh, outside of the webinar as well. Feel free to email me or to um, Type, continue to type them in chat, and I'm happy to respond. Hello, this is Jim. Um, thank you again, Cherise. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. Well, no questions so far, but we did want to pass on some praise from the uh, participants. One person writing, really enjoying all these analogies in the presentation. Super conducive to my learning style. Thank you. Good, I'm glad that they're helpful. I think that the more different kinds of ways we can represent information um, and explain information, the easier it is for students to make their own connections and, and come to their own understandings about it. All right, well with that, thank you very much for your participation today. Um, I do hope that you'll take the time to explore some of the resources. Um, there, most of them are in English, but there is one link uh, in the resources that will take you to a wiki where I have compiled a lot of these templates, especially for Spanish teachers, but also some for French and Chinese, although it is in traditional Chinese. Um, so you might take a look and see what's there and see if it gives you ideas for how you might scaffold your projects.